The old radio has an analog readout. And the new radio has a digital readout. Well, that does not mean that one radio is better than the other. The stability and the drift of a ham radio does not depend on the readout. It depends on the goodness of the oscillators of that radio. Whether how many parts per million drift are there. So if a radio has analog readouts, but it has a crystal oscillator good as one part per million, then the drift would just be 1 hertz or megahertz, 10 hertz for 10 megahertz, 30 hertz at most on the highest frequency HF band on 30 megahertz. So one can have a really good radio with an analog readout. But because the readout is analog, you turn this big dial, and whatever the pointer is set, you have to make a choice of what frequency do you declare that you read. However, with the digital readout, there is no ambiguity. The digital display would tell you what's the reading. But now, you can have a real good Swiss analog watch, or a $10 uh, digital watch from Walmart USA. Yes, I had one of those and went hiking in the summer on Lake Superior and I lost it on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Decided to go swimming, had to, to swim across a little bay and came back and dressed up and I left my watch there. I only paid $15 for it, but it was not a very good watch. So you know, if you have a digital watch, you have no dilemmas. You look and you tell the time. But it's not certain that that is the right time. So that is the deal with a ham radio also. A digital readout takes the ambiguity out. You, you are happy to read this frequency and you say that's my frequency. But it's not certain that, that it's true. So the goodness of a radio does not depend on the readout, but it does depend of the stability of the oscillators inside the radio. This is a typical temperature composited crystal oscillator for Yesu radios. Yesu has a 22.625 megahertz crystal oscillator in most their radios. And then this crystal oscillator is part of a phase lock loop and of a direct digital synthesizer system to generate all of the other frequencies necessary for tuning the radio. But the key is that it's a TCXO, temperature compensated crystal oscillators for ham radio are coming pretty well in two varieties, one part per million or 0.5 part per million. 0.5 ppm is the meaning that the drift is 1 hertz for 2 megahertz. Half a hertz for 1 megahertz. So 0.5 ppm radio, when it's tuned to 20 megahertz, it would drift a whole hertz. It might be good. That's what it actually looks like. You usually buy this as an option. <coughs> Uh, no soldering is required. You want to improve your radio, buy the TCXO unit, open up the top lid of your radio and drop in this crystal oscillator. This is old technology made by Heathfield. It was 100 kilohertz at the time they called it two cycles. The 100 kilohertz uh, calibrator it put a little signal up into a piece of wire you attach to the post, and that would radiate across the room or across your house, would be picked up by your uh, rooftop antenna, and then you could uh, calibrate the analog or the digital display of your radio by turning this calibrator on and off. There's no tuning involved. If the crystal is on 100 kilohertz, its 10 harmonic would be 1 whole megahertz, and so on. So every 100 kilohertz as you tune up and down uh, on the band, you would uh, detect the modulate 
Let's ignore that. How do receivers work? Probably everybody built a crystal set or you had one when you were young. Or you are still young now. A crystal set consists of a parallel resonance circuit and a crystal detector. Where I am from, we used to build our crystal detectors. It takes a piece uh, uh, of a lead pipe and a piece uh, of sulfur. You put uh, uh, all of those on a little shovel and stick it in a, a wood stove. You melt the lead and the sulfur. You pull it out and then it solidifies like crystals of galenite. Galenite is lead sulfate. Those crystals, you install them uh, in a little mount. Uh, usually, you bend it around from tin, and then you use a needle or a sharp uh, pointed wire to touch it. Uh, the resonant circuit is a parallel resonant circuit for the AM uh, band. Usually, it was a two-inch uh, glass container or jar or that jam in it before. And uh, you had to put the water on 150 turns of magnifier around. And to parallel tune it with a big variable 500 picture per capacitor, the galonite crystal attached to the top, according to this schematic. And the key to success was that you need a high impedance headset. None of the four, in four ohm or 16 ohm uh, computer speakers or stereo speakers would work because the four ohm impedance would short circuit the resonant tank circuit, would overburden it. So at the time when uh, I, I was in high school, 2000 ohm uh, military surplus headsets were everywhere available. Those I used. So this. Circuit diagram is eventually nothing but the circuit diagram of an AM detector. But we go back and say a crystal set is just that diagram. Then the next possible radio would be called a tuned RF receiver. Okay. For a tuned RF receiver, we return to this schematic and we attach an amplifier to it. The RF part of variable capacitor, 500 picofarad variable capacitor, you tune that and you attach a audio frequency amplifier with a single stage or two stages. In the old times, there was a one tube or a dual tube amplifier. Nowadays, you probably use one of your surplus computer speaker amplifiers uh, as they are. Uh, you, you, you just need a step-down transformer because the input impedance for a computer amplifier is uh, about 600 ohms for line impedance. So you need to step down from the tank or step up toward the tank to not overload your tank circuit. So a tuned RF receiver is a favorite project for every radio operator. That's what you do for fun. And you can even listen to signals, you pick up CW and uh, CW pretty well, not uh, signal sideband signals. Uh, AM, if, uh, the AM broadcast band, uh, that's what this circuit is very good for. For CW, you have to take that back. It wouldn't work good, eh, because yeah. it has no beat frequency yeah. oscillator. Yeah. Right, so the tuned uh, RF receiver was good for the AM broadcast band or for hunting about AM and radio uh, transmissions. Peter, what? would the super, would the super regenerative receiver pick up CW? The super regenerative, uh, that would pick it up. CW, yeah. That has an oscillator that yeah. oscillates. Now, the super regenerative is good that you mentioned that. That is the name I'm familiar with. I used to build those in high school. But now I look through the curriculum uh, they don't use this word. Instead, they use the word autodidact. So at this point, I want to tell you that what we used to know as the super regenerative receiver in our generation, later on, 
was renamed as an autodyne. Or the autodyne, what is an autodyne? Here an oscillator, which is a, an active component used as an amplifier. This amplifier amplifies even noise. From its output, the large signal is back connected to the input in a way to reinforce the phase of the signal at the input. That's how we create an oscillator. So the auto line is an oscillator that's running pretty well on the frequency you desire to pick up. You want to pick up uh, three and a half megahertz, your auto line oscillator is running on three and a half megahertz. Now the three and a half megahertz from the antenna is mixing with the three and a half megahertz of the super regenerative radio called the auto line. And uh, there is a small amount uh, of frequency. You detune the two by tuning your variable capacitor, and the small amount, the small difference would be the audio that you hear. This has a uh, kind of historical importance because no one would sell you an auto line. You can go to any ham radio store in the world and I ask them that you have an auto line radio for sale. They would just probably say, what's that? <laughs> but they, somebody put it in your curriculum. So again, the last word about the auto line. It's a tunable aux oscillator, which because it's an active component, it's automatically a mixer as well. And a mixer would create sound and different signals. Remember this, two signals are beaten together. Later on, for single segment, the outright code, a module, the beat oscillator. The word is action, beat, a signal with multiply. So signals in radio frequency mixers are multiplied. They are beaten together as so you beat X. So when you multiply two signals, this is very important and wish you remember it. You maybe remember it from Tuesday. Multiplication in the time domain is seen as addition and subtraction in the frequency domain. So you multiply two signals, and you can see those signals on your oscilloscope, but then you also have a spectrum analyzer, and you suddenly realize that on the spectrum analyzer, if I multiply 10 megahertz with 1 megahertz, I would see 11 megahertz and 9 megahertz. Some of the two and the difference of the two. Multiplication in the time domain is addition and subtraction in the frequency domain. So uh, that's what uh, that was. Uh, a tunable oscillator followed by a mixer. And then the different signal is important. So if a uh, signal from the antenna is coming down on 7.1 megahertz, your autodyne is tuned uh, what a kilohertz or two or ball. And the difference of the two would be just the audio frequency recovered. So from the autodyne or super regenerative receiver, you'll get direct audio. Again, here is this <coughs> tuned RF receiver, which you turn it into a tuned RF receiver by attaching an audio frequency amplifier. Now we attach the Autodyne mixer to the input. So this circuit did never go anywhere, it will stay there. That is the AMD modulator. And finally, the super heterodyne is invented by as many people as you wish. As uh, the night grew up uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, everything there was was in invented by Russian scientists. <laughs> then uh, when uh, I came to North America, I learned that all of those things I knew were invented by different <laughs> Russians. Some of them were invented by uh, Major Armstrong. Edwin. Edwin Armstrong was uh, an army officer, and he did do real fundamental research. Actually, when uh, I went to university in Bucharest, we studied frequency modulation, and our professor was uh, is very educated, knowledgeable, and a good professor who did not shy away to outright tell us that most know what frequency modulation was developed by an American named Armstrong. So I actually knew what Armstrong uh, 
Well, uh, Armstrong, uh, as he did go through the ranks, uh, at one time became Major Armstrong, he did improve uh, the vacuum tube amplifier and the vacuum tube uh, oscillator. He did improve the autodyne. And finally, he came up with uh, a solution which says that uh, it's best if the radio performs all of the necessary amplification and all of the necessary filtering all at the same frequency. Never mind regardless of what frequency we want to receive. We just want to receive a signal that comes in say on 10, 20 or 30 megahertz. We want that signal shifted down into a fixed location called the intermediate frequency. So the great invention of Major Armstrong was that uh, the super heterodyne receiver needs a stage called a local oscillator. This local oscillator shall be very stable to not drift, not more than a few hertz per megahertz. And this local oscillator must be tunable. In the old radios, the local oscillators were tuned by hand manually by turning the shaft of a big variable capacitor. In modern radios, for stability, there is a single crystal oscillator that produces a reference. And instead of tuning, we synthesize the frequencies by using a lookup table for the sinusoidal instantaneous values. Those values through a digital analog converter and this is called direct digital synthesizers, or by using a phase log loop. What diagram is coming up? Phase log loop is definitely used in channelized radio, CD radio. But first, we have a look at the block diagram of Major Armstrong's invention here. The super heterodyne radio starts with a radio frequency amplifier. Of course, the signal from the antenna is weak, and this stage would amplify the signal, would amplify the noise as well, would create some noise, but this is a low noise amplifier. Then the signal, so amplified, goes into the mixer. The schematic symbol of a mixer is either a circle with a cross in it, or a square box with a cross in it. The mixer has two inputs, a signal input and a local input. The local input is a signal from the local oscillator. This could be an LC oscillator or a crystal oscillator. These two signals in the mixer are picked and multiplied together to create some and difference. Some and difference. Whether the sum or the difference is used later on in the radio, that would determine if the radio uses up conversion, down conversion. Those are action words that they did not appear in the curriculum, so we do not go into up conversion and down conversion. However, we will have to mention high side and low side injection. So from the mixer, either the sound or the difference is saved, maintained, filtered out, and the filter will totally reject one component, which may be the sound or the difference. The component maintained is called the intermediate frequency, and that is being amplified now usually by three stages. Do not plug up the bond diagram, only one stage is shown, but that is a three stage solid state amplifier, integrated circuit display. Each stage has a fixed frequency filtering by means of intermediate frequency filters, which they may use crystal filters, ceramic filters, or other technology. The signal so amplified is demodulated. Demodulator is another word for detector. The word detector is used in two different places. We call it uh, the AM detector 
to demodulate the AM mode, and one of the many FM demodulators is called a detector, particularly the one invented by Foster and Seeley, uh, two engineers who together invented uh, a demodulator for FM, which was later on improved and modified, and its name changed into the ratio detector. So the word detector may be used for AM and for FM as well. And on RDM, if I complete the circuit. Here, this would not be a test question, but it's just so easy. We all went to high school, and you know that cos x multiplied by cos y. This is the process of beating two signals, multiplying two signals. It is multiplying dot, and if you remember this identity from your trigonometry class, cos x times cos y is one half of the difference plus the sum. Now, you substitute x and y with the local oscillator frequency and the R frequency from the antenna. Therefore, this equation gives you the difference between the local oscillator and the RF signal and the sum of the two. Now, either the difference or the sum carries the same uh, amount of intelligence. So the intermediate frequency amplifier is set for the one or for the other. Choice of the designer. So that was the block diagram of uh, the super heterodyne radio, pretty well as Major Armstrong conceived it. And underneath the bolt, the definition of high side injection and low side injection. If the local oscillator frequency is larger than the frequency coming down from the antenna you want to receive. We call that high side injection because the local oscillator is on the high side. It's higher than the RF. However, one can insert a local oscillator frequency below the incoming RF and that would we call low side injection. High side injection and low side injection. As radio communication started, we had AM radio and the frequencies on the AM radio were as low as down to 150 kilohertz. That's called a long waves. So for a few hundred kilohertz, just there was no room to go low below Earth, as do you go below 150 kilohertz. So whole AM radio in Europe and in North America started as high side injection. Nowadays, when we have microwave bands up to 24 gigahertz and above, uh, or even VHF uh, at 444 and UHF at 432 megahertz, those frequencies, frequencies are high enough that there is plenty room to do low side injection. So the rule is that the lower the frequency you want to work with, the more you need to do a high side, side injection. And the higher the RF signal you want to receive, the more you can afford low side injection. They both are coming with trouble. The problem is called image frequency interference. 455 kilohertz is an extremely widely used frequency. Chance there is that you have it somewhere in your modern ham radio. Uh, that is one of the many intermediate frequencies. At the beginning, when AM radio broadcasting started, everybody's radio receiver had a 455 kilohertz IF. So I'm using this example. This is a desired station. And the local oscillator in the receiver, or oh, it shows you the web page where I stole it from. Or oh, image. To Google search for it and plug it in. So now the local oscillator is on the high side of the desired station. The difference in between the two is the intermediate frequency. Now, by the way, totally by accident, somewhere on the band, 
Somebody else is transmitting accidentally on a frequency which is precisely, precisely wrong image frequency or wrong intermediate frequency amount above the local oscillator. So suppose the local oscillator is running on 1,455 kHz. The signal that's being received is 1,455 minus 455, one even megahertz as one of our local AM radio stations. But what if there is a radio station at one point, what is 450, 910, 1.910, 1,910 kilohertz. This frequency is from a strong radio station, so it muscles through the input tuning circuits, the input amplifier, and a sufficient amount of it penetrates the mixer, and the mixer doesn't know anything but do some different. So the mixer says, well, I will do the difference from those two signals. We'll do the sum as well, but the sum will be totally rejected in a filter. But the difference turn, turns out to be 455 again. So you are trying to listen to a one megahertz local AM radio, and if there is, maybe there isn't. If there is another signal at uh, 1,910, your radio would pick that up too. And you hear two radio stations all at once. Well, there are all kinds of measures to eliminate this, but this is the idea of image frequency interference. So now I did do a, a few numerical examples here. Suppose we are running a ham radio on the 28 megahertz band with a local oscillator of 19 megahertz. So the low side injection example uses 19 megahertz, which is less than 28, and the difference is 9 megahertz as the desired intermediate frequency. But what if accidentally there is uh, a uh, radio station, as there is one, it's the worldwide plug from Boulder, on broadcasting on 10 megahertz. This 10 megahertz radio station, if it penetrates into a radio, it could get mixed with the 19 megahertz local oscillator to produce the intermediate frequency. So now, you tune your radio to, to listen to 28 megahertz, and you hear something in the background that you really don't want. That's the 10 megahertz transmission. So what is it we can do about this? Well, we can push the image frequency real hard. Because the image frequency apparently appears two increments of intermediate frequency above or below the desired signal. So let's just make the intermediate frequency really large, such as 60 megahertz. And the image frequency would appear 120 megahertz above or below. It's so far away that there's very little chance that the frequency is so remote, so distant from the tuning frequency would be able to go through the receiver end. And the high side ejection example for the same uh, signal. If the RF desire is 29 megahertz and we run a local oscillator of 38, the difference would be 9 megahertz <coughs> for the IF. However, if there is a patio telephone or a, a, some signal on 47 megahertz that penetrates into the radio, mixes with the 38 megahertz IF, we still hear the image frequency interference. So what are the two things we can do to eliminate image frequency? One, to make the intermediate frequency ever so large, and those radios, uh, uh, RAM radios, uh, uh, you buy um, today's technology, puts the intermediate frequency in the 40, 50, 60 megahertz domain. The other measure that they do, that they use a roofing filter, uh, the word roofing filter would suggest that a filter that looks like the roof of a house 
I attached art walls as the walls of the brick walls. It's called the brick wall filter as well. We use a filter so good that an image frequency interfering signal above or below has no chance to go through. So those are the two things we can do to eliminate image frequency. And one of uh, the filters that has uh, very good properties, brick walls, is called the mechanical filter. And I found this image of a mechanical filter. What's a mechanical filter? It's based on mechanical resonance. Uh, there is a metal rod that looks like the crankshaft of, of your car. If you ever looked into the engine of your car, there is a crankshaft. And the crankshaft has uh, cams, and in between the cams, sections of shaft. Now, those sections of shaft for the mechanical filter, they have different lengths and different thickness, so they have mechanical mass. So they all resonate at their own resonant frequency. And at the end of the shaft, there are pickup coils. So the input is excited. All of those different mechanical shaft components, they resonate on their favorite frequencies. And only those resonant frequencies are coupled to the output. So there are several offset nearby resonant frequencies and the response blends together into one characteristic. Besides mechanical filters, crystal filters made from quartz oscillator are also used. The FM receiver is not much different from uh, the AM receiver. We have an extra stage here, the limiter. Remember from Tuesday, FM is a constant power mode. Whether you talk or don't talk, what you do, you always transmit the same amount of power. So any noise that's picked up and it overshoots on the top and on the bottom of your FM signal, it just does not, not belong there. So we can well afford to pass the signal through a limiter, which is a positive-negative clipper. So the noise is got to read by the limiter, and then we go into the frequency demodulator. For FM, the inventors of the very first frequency demodulator were Foster and Sealy. And the Foster and Sealy discriminator was improved and turned into the ratio detector. Foster and Sealy and ratio detector, they use uh, ferrite cores and uh, coils with uh, a core that you tune with uh, an alignment tool. So therefore, those are mechanical components, and they are more expensive nowadays. So lately, we use integrated circuit technology. Quadrature detectors and phase lock loops are integrated circuits. They do not need uh, mechanical components. So the Foster and Sealy and the ratio detector, they are perfectly good working linear discriminators. They are just more expensive to manufacture and they turn to integrated circuits. This is an illustration how an FM signal that picks up noise on the top and the bottom is passed through the limiter to promote all even amplification. And this is a so called ceramic filter, 10.7 megahertz filter. 10.7 megahertz is one of the many standard values for intermediate frequencies for FM radios. How to receive single sideband and CW? My favorite equation is there again. You can write this up with cos A times cos B or cos omega carrier and cos omega intelligence. The thing is that when you multiply two signals, you beat them together. When you multiply, you create some indifference. So to receive single sideband, remember that an SSB signal does not have a carrier. The carrier was totally eliminated, and so was one of the sidebands. So a beat frequency oscillator is merely a local oscillator that reinserts what is missing from the signal. We did eliminate the carrier for the transmitter, so we have to reinsert it here. After it's being reinserted, 
Then the reinserted carrier adds and subtracts with the incoming RF down on the IF level. And the difference is what we maintain, and that's the audio that uh, would drive the audio equipment. Why do we need a beat frequency oscillator to receive CW? Well, CW is sent out as a single frequency. A single frequency, when it passes through a demodulator, it creates direct current component only. Because you remember the previous schematic of uh, the diode detector, it looked like a half-wave rectifier. And that's what it is. A half-wave rectifier with an output filter. So CW signal with an AM detector, after half-wave rectification, would just produce uh, uh, an unintelligible direct current component. So the beat frequency oscillator is purposely offset a few hundred thirds above or below the incoming CW signal. Uh, by preference, and you can tune that up or adjust it in your radio. I, I like 700 hertz. Other people like to hear more scores as low as 400 and as high as 1000 hertz. Okay, so you can set the offset between the beam frequency oscillator and the incoming CW. Therefore, if the single sideband receiver already has a beat frequency oscillator, it would naturally demodulate CW signals as well. For CW, instead of a direct current component, you want to hear an audio. So the beat frequency oscillator is put 800 hertz above or below. Well, why is above or why below? Which one is better? Well, this is a signal to noise ratio question. Some radio receivers, they give you a choice to try high side and low side injection. And you stick with whichever one has uh, a noise advantage. If you hear one or the other better, uh, I really never uh, uh, change the, the settings of my radio. My ASU radio always uses high side injection to the big frequency oscillator. I left it like that and it works for me. So the product detector is nothing else but a balanced modulator. We have a schematic on the transmitter uh, section handle of a balanced modulator. Remember, there are two transformers and two diodes, and two more diodes backwards. And the local oscillator on the positive and on the negative going out period alternatingly passes a sample of the audio direct or reverse with the cross connected diodes. Uh, if we talked about 8,000 samples for audio for the telephone company, night twist rate or so, well, this is somewhat similar, but the sampling rate is many, many million times. Uh, a beat frequency oscillator uses a frequency. If the intermediate frequency amplifier is 10.7 megahertz, the beat frequency oscillator is 10.7 megahertz plus 700 hertz. So it's a real high uh, oversampling rate. Or is it product detector? Product detector is an actual balanced modulator. Audio filters may be attached at the output. Now, if you just buy a stock uh, short wave radio or, or ham radio transceiver, there's very limited audio filtering in it. All their commercial AM broadcast radio receivers, they had something called the tone control. The tone, tone control was just a potentiometer and a capacitor to insert an RC time constant to change uh, the phase of the audio and uh, the time constant of the RC circuit acted as the cutoff frequency of uh, a uh, first order low pass filter. So there was very some very limited control about filtering. But uh, on aftermarket filter such as this one, we, we obviously is a Canadian amateur and uh, he has 
several free pieces of software you can download, and one like this one would turn uh, the sound card of your computer into an adjustable bandwidth filter. Further include, you can also buy it from MFG Electronics, an outright no filter in a box that you connect between the output and the speaker of uh, your radio and have some adjustment on the bandwidth. The adjustment are always that you sacrifice bandwidth to cut out some of the noise content. And if the signal is strong and, and there is very little noise, then you may increase the bandwidth to have a more pleasant, rich sound to, to work with. What is an S meter? It stands for a signal strength meter. Here you need to do this little algebra. Uh, I'm certain that you are up to it. 10 times the logarithm of a power ratio is power expressed in decibels. Now we also know that power in an electric uh, circuit is what is squared over R. So if you double your voltage, then you quadruple your power, because 2 squared is 4. Each time you double your voltage for the same load, you increase the power fourfold. So the S meter monitors the signal coming down from the antenna. And this convention was used that if the ham radio signal is so strong now that it puts two times as much voltage into my radio, then the power I receive is four times as much. So whether you use the two times voltage or the four times power, the logarithmic formula works out the same. Times the logarithm of four times the power is six decibels. But 10 times the logarithm was voltage squared over R. By the property of the logarithm, the logarithm of anything on an exponent because that exponent comes to the front to multiply the 10. So the square comes here to make the 20 log voltage ratio. Well, the voltage ratio is only 2. But 2 times 2 is 4. So again, this ratio of 4 appears. Final conclusion, if the signal in your radio picks up, suddenly is so strong that it has twice the voltage, then you get four times the power, and we like to say that now we are better off by six decibels. So the industry makes those meters called the signal strength meter. The meter may be analog or digital, but it's certainly each increment on the scale is another six decibel step, which is representative of four times the previous amount of power, or two times the previous amount of voltage. The S meter is only good for relative indications. It's really not really well calibrated. And many manufacturers, they violate the rule of six decibel steps. Sometimes they use five, six, seven, whichever way it works out for them. There is common agreement, however, if your radio displays S1, then that is pretty well at the limit. That is the sensitivity of your radio. If a signal equals with the rated sensitivity of radio comes down from the antenna, that should move the S meter to S1. That's the S meter, and now there is one more topic left. And with any luck, uh, I try to fire up my laptop here. Let's see. I have a software to find radio with me. Uh, Mike has one or two also. Let's just see what's going to happen there. So this is booting. That's an antenna. I'll give you my antenna, which will probably be a little better. Okay, then I shall bring your whole setup for a moment. Then you turn the laptop for on, and you get to do this as we port here or here. I grab my laptop at home, 
and he told me, please do not turn me off on installing 1500. I carried it with me in the car and up here it, uh, it sends uh, free Wi-Fi. Started from update number three and in the break uh, installed all 15. And then while I was talking, it turned the power off and now I'm booting again. <laughs> And it goes through the Enigma software uh, virus uh, checkup. Well, we could really do it on that computer too. We need to install software to, to do Oh, we do it. Okay, you haven't got that software with you. No, no the software is uh, a download from the internet, so. Oh, okay, it takes too long. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. It can be done, but. Uh, we really, I don't think they want us to install software to their computers. No, no. So, uh, she didn't mind what we did with that. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, they really don't mind. Uh, I'm sure we like a pen study. Yeah. It's not a yeah, they have to put the driver, uh, yeah, uh, the driver yeah, they have chipset, yeah. and so on. make more sense all of that? Yeah. Well, I didn't mean yeah. now, uh, yeah. for the review yeah. next week. Oh, so. yeah. It says starting windows, so when they are down at the seniors for the, uh, the club meeting, then uh, we have an overhead projector, which uh, I can plug in a laptop into that and just project my own screen. But in here, yeah, even HDMI to, cable. to do that would be... We got an HDMI truth in the meantime, what, what is a software-defined radio? If you have your notes or your books, you look at the block diagram of the AM receiver. On the AM receiver, there is a stage called a detector, a demodulator. You cut the piece of paper there, cut out that detector, fold it away, and hold what's left. At that point, where the detector enters in the picture, that's where you attach the software-defined radio, which Michael has in this box. The software-defined radio has a local oscillator, which feeds two different mixers, multiplies signals, but the local oscillator generates sinusoids of the sine and of the cos nature. You know that cos is leading sine by 90 degrees. So the cos signal is usually called the in-phase signal. And the sine signal is called the quadrature signal, 90 degrees away. And they rotate together. So we have an in-phase and a quadrature signal, an in-phase and a quadrature modulator. Those frequencies are at the frequency of the intermediate frequency. Could be 10.7 megahertz or so. So they do some and difference, and the difference is audio frequency. So the audio frequency from the in-phase and the quadrature mixers is fed to the left and right sound tracks of the sound card of a computer. And from there, the digital signal processor in the sound cards would sample those signals, convert them into digital code, and apply the AM, FM, or CW, the modulate uh, algorithm. Uh, I apologize for this Toshiba laptop. Now it's configuring Windows and it's 38% complete. 70%, <laughs> 88, 100, do not turn off your computer. What <laughs> other aggravation? <laughs> oh, lovely. We will try that out too. <laughs> Well, I am in here just one step from uh, $14 down. I'm just thinking like I've already seen it. You know, television, any frequency, you can build it, you can buy it, and you can buy it. You can't transmit, but you can receive it. It's cheap. Like, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah, 
This is a software defined angle elsewhere, like way in Europe. And my promise is controlling it over the internet. Actually, this one's a known source. It is, it? Yeah, B E one C W B one. I found one in Holland. Uh, so these yeah. chat rooms strong enough that we can hear it here? No. Well, this is going to the internet. Um, uh -huh. right now we're on 7.190. Can't hear the other title. That's still uh, not very good. Yeah, the other one is 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 so we're uh, controlling. Yeah, we're checking out the sure the signal between that and the satellite. Um, no, it's just Wi Fi and just everywhere else. It doesn't recognize your regulations. Okay, it's probably right here. So it's secondary to read it. Where's your uh, thing like in here? This is set. Well, first you're going from your phone to the Wi Fi, and you say you're going to be able to the same thing. And the unit is just because they're receiving the same thing. Right? So, where are they receiving it? Nova Scotia. That's the UC. Yeah, Nova Scotia. That's the radio. This is live audio. Actually, somebody's going to contest right now. And you can tune it. This one, right? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Hopefully it worked all well. Let me know. Like I said, I couldn't hear it before going in, but it looked it looked like it was. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, no, it's just a regular ham station, um, uh, but it's set up, he's linked it to a computer, um, and then this has the app on it, so that I can, yeah, then the actual is the the Yeah, we to Yeah, we're 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 to Yeah, the antenna is a uh, Michael's antenna. We pick up a local FM radio station. And for tuning, you drive the spectrum with the uh, mouse. I'm hunting for a different signal. There is one coming. And what radio station do you think you're getting? But they also make software to find radio where you can transmit as well. Oh yes, they make a lot of dollars. And it's just like this, you just move on a circuit around the computer, computer. And, it decodes, and it decodes everything. It's here. Did yes. yes. you uh, uh, software you know, like this? Um, that can also receive uh, the weather satellites as well. You can actually decode the weather satellites and get the actual uh, actual pictures from the weather satellites. Yes, further decode it. And you can pick up many frequencies up to 1.8 gigahertz. For this star, uh, uh, this uh, module for it. Uh, yes, there's a module. My SDR sharp does not have uh, the model. I'll get the model. Uh, that actually, you can have there. I've got the plug in. It's a little plug in. You can put it in. Yep. You can see it. I'll get it. I'll get my hand and show everybody. Yes, here is another. See, you do uh, by dragging the whole spectrum into the highlighter. Peter, do you want me to put it together? Do you want to put it together for them? Or that be great. Whatever, you, either both of you guys can send out send it to others. Whatever, whatever you want. Cheap, 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 cheap. And we are on the internet. You do a Google search for this business, N O O Electric. No Electric. They have a, a store in Michigan, that's where I ordered it. Or if you are shopping on eBay, you will search this for SDR Dongle. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Software defined software defined radio dongle. Radio dongle. And you almost need the RTL chipset. Uh, that's the thing that plugs into the uh, the USB port, and then so you say that. We we'll draw part on the USB. And the USB port device, the dongle is for. Uh, this dongle originally is a television receiver, a European standard. If you travel in Europe. You stick this into your computer, run their software, and you see live TV on your laptop. But for North America, we don't have their standard. So for us, a developer wrote the radio software. So there's a hardware radio in this. There's a mixer, a local oscillator, intermediate frequency amplifier, and uh, it, it has the IQ detector. 
and it, it sends the stream on the USB wire into the computer for digital signal processing. You need an antenna with that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I see what That's I thought on over there. That's why we don't hear a signal. So we need an antenna and a dongle? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Micro it, uh, you you uh, get an antenna with it, but it's a little puny thing. Uh, please grab this antenna and grab the laptop and let's walk toward the window to see if it's a good one. Yeah, go to the window. You might get a better signal. You might get something better. Let's hear that I can... 